Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, session of the Soil and Nutrition Conference. I know you're usually expecting Dan. Uh, my name is Liz Joseph and I'm subbing in for him for this opening part. Uh, he got tied up, but he'll join us for the Q&A later on. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. I'm the conference coordinator uh, and it's so nice to come on here and say hello and just share how wonderful it's been to work alongside Dan um, and also Chris Petrus, who is behind the scenes at every single one of these sessions. So thank you, Chris, um, planning the conference. And we're just so thankful to all of you as well for making this conference possible um, for your engagement, your participation, um, for all of our incredible speakers. We've just been blown away also by the reach of this year's conference, um, a silver lining of needing to go virtual. I think we're up to something like 30 countries and almost all 50 states. I think we're at 49 states. Um, so just really thankful for all of all of the engagement and that we can do this journey together on these Thursdays throughout the year. Um, we're at the midpoint now, and so we're working on ways to increase engagement, both between speakers and attendees, as well as amongst attendees. So stay tuned for that. And we'll also put the link in the chat again um, this week to gather more information about how we can best serve you in that way. Um, so with that, it's my honor to introduce Jill Clapperton. Uh, Jill is the principal scientist and CEO of Rhizoterra. Uh, she is an internationally recognized educator on how to create, measure, and maintain healthy, productive soils that produce tasty, nutrient-dense food. Um, and Jill is also the principal scientist for the Real Food Campaign and has spoken uh, at the Soil and Nutrition Conference in years past. So Jill, we're so thankful that you're we have you playing such a critical part of this work in the Real Food Campaign um, and in your wider work. And we're really eager to hear what you have to share with us today. So with that, I'll hand it over to you. All right, well, thank you very much, Liz. Um, we're gonna share my screen right now. So let's just do that right at this moment. And we'll put that up there, giving away the first slide. Okay, here we are. Um, well, everyone, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd love to be seeing all your smiling faces and um, being able to see your raised hands and your enthusiasm. And I'll admit that it's kind of hard to present to myself, you know, but uh, here we go. I'm just going to pretend that all the birds and everything else that's outside that I'm looking at um, are actually my audience. Uh, we're going to talk about the discovery analysis, recovery, and rebuilding of nutrient density in food. Um, and it, it was, it's really fun to do it, but at the same time, this is a really hard topic. Um, you wouldn't think so, uh, because nutrient density has been an important part of agriculture for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, uh, nutrient density and agriculture go together. Um, without it, you know, we, we wouldn't be doing as well as we do. Uh, and of course, um, you know, we're, the food supply is struggling. And so how do we make it better and, and what's been going on there and how do we, how do we deal with that? So, um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me. And I realize my email is not on the front of that, but we will provide that so that you can email questions. But of course the chat is open, so you know, have at it. And you're welcome to ask questions as we go along. All right, farmers, chefs, anybody who enjoys growing things or enjoys eating things, um, all of this is interlaced. So there's no preparing food, growing food, eating food, enjoying food is all linked together. And the whole idea is to gain nourishment. And well, nourishment is, uh, as I was reminded by my friend and mentor, Dr. Ross Welsh, is you are you what you eat, but don't excrete. Um, and so uh, I just, I love lots of pictures of food. So the first one, and I think I can use my cursor here, I think, yeah. These are chefs at Stone Barns, a Blue Hill restaurant at Stone Barns. 
The middle one is my friend, um, Anna. Anna's from Denmark and she is a third generation woman farmer. And the last photo is a friend, um, Sergio from Argentina and Brazil, um, enjoying his seafood, um, getting a good dose of selenium. I'm going to take today, I'm going to take the large view. So we are going to be zooming around in taking a space view of nutrient density and um, how we grow nutrient density, uh, how we think about nutrient density, how we choose food. I mean, how do we choose food? Wow, we, we need to think about that a little bit. Okay, how do we decide what foods to eat? Well, you know, as I said, I, I, I mean, I suppose we, as early humans, we spend a long time just looking around and observing what other things we're eating. And then, you know, through trial and error decided that this works for us, you know, or feeding it to the, the person that you didn't like and seeing if they died and if they did it or they got sick, well, you wouldn't eat it. Um, you know, I imagine that there was a fair amount of that. Uh, as populations grew though, um, you know, I'm imagining that it would have been increasingly hard for us to feed each other. Um, and we couldn't just move all the time because maybe we it was really hard to move all the time or you know you were hoping that you actually had to find another resource patch which a lot of animals do i mean they move from one resource patch to the other and i imagine the early home humans did the same thing but imagine that it would be a lot easier if you found a really nice place that you like to live and clearly your population was doing doing well you would want to stay there and you'd want to cultivate things and domesticate animals. And of course, more yield was better. And I mean, if we take the example of wheat, um, we've been domesticating wheat uh, over, you know, sort of more than 10,000 years. And part of what we've selected for along the way is for easy threshing, you know, so that we could easily, you know, whack the grain out because at this point we didn't have threshing machines and we were just sort of hand whacking it uh, making sure that we got the seeds out and so we were also selecting for the ability to whack out the seeds fairly easily collect them and store them uh, so we were we have always been selecting our food and not necessarily on the basis of nutrient density you know looks great tastes amazing uh, that's probably a lot of how we select it. And in fact, the research shows that that is a lot of the way that we choose how to eat what's healthy and what's good for us is by visual sensory cues. Um, if it tastes good, we like it. If it looks great, we might try it. Um, if there's an abundance of it, we might also have a go. Um, so we haven't really in some ways changed that much. The civilizations, we know that, you know, the early civilizations, and this is Anastasis, um, had elaborate irrigation systems. Uh, and I mean, they were elaborate and really amazing. They cultivated corn and other plants. They stored seeds. I mean, in this case, that, and this is um, near Bandelier, uh, in New Mexico, they actually raised macaws and they left us to wonder what happened to them. Like, where did they go? Did they, and, and a lot of the ideas like, you know, this is just like the, the loss of some great civilizations, the Incas and the Aztecs, um, the Toltecs, the Mayans. I mean, did they starve? Did they die of disease? I mean, or did they just leave somehow? Um, we also have to ask how do they how did they decide what to eat and was that related to the why they moved did they use up all the soil um did they not have enough nutrients anymore i mean what happened and so we were always speculating that this is something to do with location and landscape and these things and again how do we choose so how do we decide what to eat what foods to eat um you know, it's, it's a question, and actually 
There is a surprising amount of research on this, um, by the way. Um, there are social scientists all over the world that are asking that question because of course it's about marketing, right? I mean, marketing food. How do we decide? You know, test groups, uh, choices. How do we get kids to eat better? Uh, how do we deal with obesity? What, why are people choosing the foods that they're choosing? Um, and Plastic actually has been doing a lot of research on this. Um, uh, and it's in, in the Journal of Nutrients, the Journal of Appetite. If you check out either of those journals, you'll find a lot of information on factors that influence the perceived healthiness of foods or how we choose the foods. Um, and again, we're trying to decide, you know, trying to understand how people decide what they eat. Um, and it seems that communication of the ingredients, so how we communicate the ingredients is really, really important and trust that they're being reported accurately. Um, and I think accuracy comes becomes a really important part of, of what we're, you know, of, of thinking about all this. Um, and, and what it came down to was trust. There was a lot of, a lot of the research I read came down to trust, like trusting that it's being reported accurately, trusting the person that you're buying your food from that they are being accurate in representing the food that they are selling to you. Um, but, all the studies show the same thing. Um, in the end, it's about taste and sensory features of the food product that we're looking at decides whether we choose it or not, um, which is again, really interesting. Um, so also, so the next question that we ask ourselves and, and we're sort of getting into this discovery phase uh, is, well, what is the, what is healthy food. What is food quality? And Dan and I have wrestled with this a lot and we've thrown it around to a lot of people and we've all, you know, been really working on this question and trying to understand it. But, um, and I'm going to, wait a minute, next slide. Oh, back. Here we are. Sensory perception. Um, before we get into that next question of what is food quality, um, I wanted to show you that Sensor, sensory perception is a big part of soils too. I mean, not only just the food, but also the soil. We can tell a lot about the soil and how good it is and how organic it is and what's happening in the soil just from the smell. And that is similar to food. So what is food quality? Well, I actually really like this definition of food quality. It's the EU definition that was, um, uh, adopted in 2012, uh, and the FAO has, UN FAO has also adopted this definition. It has a lot to do with, you know, where did the food come from, nutrition, sensory, authenticity, and again, where authenticity is also about trust. That functional one is kind of interesting. Um, because there's a lot of interest in functional foods and what are they and whatnot. Aesthetical, aesthetically pleasing, ethical, but also um, going back to the opposite side origin is, is ethnic, ethnic foods, like what foods we grow. I'm not so sure the safety part of it at the top. I'm really buying into that because the one thing I can say is that um, when we grow, some of the vegetables that we grow, sometimes, you know, uh, depending on what kind of a season we've had, we put a lot of our vegetables into food processing so that we don't have to deal with the safety issue of handling, you know, like whether we are going to get slapped with, you know, somebody who had nasty hands in the supermarket um, and uh, ended up touching a bunch of the squashes and some people got E. coli and, then it comes back on the grower. So, and the other thing is sometimes, uh, well, actually a lot of times when we're handling fresh food, we have to carry a lot of insurance in order to make sure that if we did get sued for some reason on a food safety issue, 
rightly or wrongly, that we had enough money and we had enough insurance in order to cover ourselves. So I don't think food quality should necessarily be based on that because I think there's a lot of, I don't know, I'm standing on my soapbox for that one, but I really, I like the safety part taken out of it because I think food quality should be more about how it's grown and the nutrient density and whether people want it or not. And, but I also realize that if people don't feel the food is safe, they don't want it either. And I remember at the start of, you know, a real organic movement that part of, there were a lot of scientists touting the fact that organic food wouldn't be very safe because of all the manure that was used. And to this day, a lot of times, you know, like where you can only have animals on at a certain time and you can, there are a lot of regulations around that just to maintain the food safety and food quality. So I'd be interested to know what everybody's thinking about that. Um, I'm just threw up this slide because I wanted you to actually see the definition um, and understand sort of where it came from. Um, and some of the things that people were thinking about when they were talking about food quality. And this is part of the discovery phase, like what is nutrient density? Because nutrient density is a big part of food quality, I think. Um, and so that's why I bring in food quality because I think that quality is also reflected in nutrient density. And I think that, you know, if the food isn't any good for you then, um, and doesn't have enough nutrition for you or enough energy to provide your needs, then it doesn't really matter. So, and, and then how the next question comes into that analyzing question is, how do we know that food is really good for us? Like, how do we know? Um, and do we accept what's on the back of the package? Well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Um, uh, do we, uh, you know, do we run an analysis? I mean, a lot of people are asking these questions. A lot of consumers are asking these questions. People are, have been buying organic food because they thought it was better for them. That's not always true from a nutritional density standpoint. Um, but we're hoping that it's gonna even itself across the field and that as people grow in a more regenerative fashion, we're going to even out some of that nutritional quality. But you'll see as we go along, genetics are also important. I mean, I think the one thing that came to me as I was thinking about writing this talk was that food and agriculture have always gone together. And it's unfortunate that nutrient density has not been an explicit outcome of agriculture. In fact, it's been the exact opposite. It's been about more food and if we grow more food, even if it's bad food, well, it's cheap to fortify it. And yeah, I, I disagree with that. I think somehow we've decided that, um, you know, we'll, we'll just add the nutrients we need. And I think as we, one of the arguments that I heard the other day when I was discussing this with um, Julian was, you know, he said, well, what happens if we do go ahead and, and, and dissect all this, then aren't they just gonna, you know, look at all the nutrients that are in food and just go, hey, maybe we should just, you know, just keep add, just keep growing food, uh, as much food as we can, and just keep fortifying it. And I, I think, obviously, you're going to see as we go along, I think that's a bad model, but I also think that we can actually grow the nutrients in the food, and we won't have to go to the fortification model. And and I've also, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And we're going to hear more about fortification as we go forward. I think the other thing is that yield has been as being this the um, the goal of of agriculture. Well, yield has been because we've all we we have this fear that we don't have enough. Like we don't have enough food, um, and we won't be able to feed ourselves. And I hear that all the time from a lot of young people. Well, you know, I'm worried, you know, my kids will never get to eat. They won't have any food because we're running out of food because every, you know, we've got stupid population. We're never gonna have enough food. 
that is just incorrect. Um, and I don't know where we got that notion and I don't know why the models are predicting that notion. Um, maybe um, I've been reading the black swan lately and maybe that is a black swan event uh, that we won't have any food because right now I can tell you that farmers can produce enough food. Um, are we running out of land, uh, arable land? Sometimes in some places we surely are. Can we recover that land? We have great projects that show we can recover it. It's about need to recover it. And there are lots of agencies who believe that we need to recover it. There are lots of governments who probably would not want to recover it. And if we think about it, what is the best way to control a population? or to control a group of people that you don't like very much, or a group of people that are politically not aligned with you, uh, and the easiest way to do that is to starve them. Um, the easiest way is not to distribute food. And we see that all the time. There are lots of, lots and lots of examples of this, and not just in Africa. Um, so darn it, we're still, and, and darn it, we are still trying to decide what is, soil quality and soil health and how do we how do we measure that and and what is it um i'm going to share a story here about temple grandin uh temple and i were at a meeting together in cheyenne wyoming and um i was talking about soil health and soil quality and you know sort of muse and we i was the students from the college and we were musing over well what is it and in typical temple fashion, she said, well, it seems to me you know a lot about what it's not. So why do you care what it is? Just make sure it's not any of those things you know it's not. Once again, that way of thinking, we need to open our minds and, and really think about these things in a very different way and start, because I think if we start thinking a different way, we have a better chance of changing the paradigm. So to my surprise, when I Googled, how do you measure your nutrient density in food? I got bricks as the number one hit for how you measure nutrient density in food. Um, actually, when we look at mineral nutrients, um, and I guess I should clarify that, um, with that same scientist, or group of scientists that told me that pregnant women would be probably our best choice um, also told me that one of the best um, one of the best indicators of nutrient density was zinc, um, and that zinc could be measured fairly regular readily. Uh, zinc was an essential nutrient for not only your immune health but also for musk uh, your mitochondria for energy and to keep your muscles going and also uh you know brain function and and that it was considered to be uh, a nutrient that was um in causing is causing us to be malnourished throughout the world um so one of the things i have focused on is zinc and you will see as i present my data on nutrient density you'll see that focus and so i wanted to explain my focus um, I have tried really hard to correlate a lot of things with BRICS, and I have been very unsuccessful. Um, and not just me, there's been a number of other people too. I do know people who are great at BRICS. Um, they, they can see increases. They do the same thing over and over again, and that is the key. Um, even if you're making a mistake, repeat it so that you can start to see changes. Um, if you're monitoring your data, then make sure that you sampling your bricks at the same time every day um, in the same plants, things like that, so that you can compare, you know, your readings and know if things are changing. Um, so consistency is the key. It's the key in science. It's the, I tell my grad students all that, and my students just please be consistent. Um, you can change after the experiment, but be consistent um, during. The time you're experimenting and and change over time is one of the key factors honestly um 
we want to see change over time. I've had a couple of my physician friends say that that actually is really important. You know, want to see the trend line over time. Um, so I'm going to say I would like you to use something other than bricks. But if you're really good at bricks and you're really comfortable with bricks, go for it. But it's certainly not the gold standard. Um, I came across this too, Dr. Furman's index of um, what is healthy food. Um, I was fascinated by it. Uh, it's there, Dr. Drew Zosky also, I think that's how you say his name, um, is also proposing an index very similar to this, where the energy of food or the calories, which is a lot of what food quality has been based on for a long time, um, that you consider the nutrients as a function of calories. And so this index has been used for quite some time, uh, it turns out by Dr. Furman, um, and it's also being proposed for use um, in our, by the NRCS um, and by the Department of Ag as they go through what is nutrient density, what is food quality, you know, and, and the food and the healthy food index. Um, this is, he calculates some of this for you and gives you the scores of the kinds of things that you might want to eat um, based on the nutrient value and the en amount of energy that they're going to give you. Now, what's really interesting about this is this is a lot of that, this is very similar to how dairy um, nutritionists also calculate dairy diets. And the one thing that really struck me as I've worked on animals, uh, worked with livestock herds, is that um, people tend to know a lot more about what they feed their animals than they know about what they feed themselves. Um, and really, uh, it should we should be even in that regard. We should know what we feed ourselves. We should be thinking about the energy, amount of energy we feed ourselves and our children, as well as the amount of energy and the types of food that we feed our animals, because we all need to be healthy. You can send your food to a lab. Um, there are a number of labs that do nutritional analysis. This one is more, they're talking about labels. So they're gonna certify the food so that you can put this on, your, on a label. Um, there are other ways to do it too. And, um, you know, and we're working on that. That's one thing I can say that we are actively working on ways in which we can report nutrient density. And anybody can make an ingredient claim. You cannot make a health claim without having done a health study. That probably hasn't stopped some people, but it should be the way it is. Um, X-ray fluore fluorescence spectroscopy is one of the tools that I've used for the, now, for the last five years. Um, it's handheld and I came to use it because you know, people kept saying to me, you know, Jill, you need a, we need to know our results. Like, are our analysis really correct? You know, we send the same thing to five different labs and get five different answers. We just don't know, you know, how do you figure it out? And so I thought, well, do I do my own lab and start doing my own data? You know, um, all these labs are accredited, so they should be following the procedures. But in order to really make money in a laboratory, you have to run thousands of samples a day. And I mean thousands. I mean, in some of the laboratories, given the amount of equipment they have, they have to run like 10,000 samples a day. So you are gonna lose some of your quality control at that, even if you don't want to. Um, and the only other way to do it is charge a lot of money and run a smaller number of samples so that you can pay more attention to your quality control and your quality assurance. Um, this little gadget here though, um, it is it does elemental analysis. So again, I said that I have concentrated on the elements. It measures anything from sodium to uranium. Um, it is very, it is similar to a laboratory grade instrument that would do the same thing. Um, and it gives you the analysis in 30 seconds and it's totally portable. So it means the kind of thing, so I started very early on getting into handheld instruments or instruments that took up a smaller footprint because let's face it, buildings cost money. And so um, if you wanna have a laboratory or that, you need to have not spend so much money on the building, but more money on your instruments. So handheld instruments have a lot of possibilities. 
Um, you can use wet chemistry and uh, we're getting ready to do that. Um, the office I'm in right now is part of a laboratory uh, that we're just building and you'll see I've got a picture of some of the boxes and the space, um, which is mostly just empty right now except for boxes until we get our wet chemistry and our gold standard instruments installed and that will be a gas chromatograph with a mass spectrometer and a liquid chromatography with a gas with a mass spectrometer. In this case, we were analyzing radish sprouts for sulforaphane, which is a powerful anti-cancer. And you can do this with a, a smaller instrument, which is not nearly as expensive, called the UV Viz. Um, and it works really well for doing this kind of work. And by the way, radish sprouts and um, broccoli sprouts are very high in this anti-cancer compound um, and well worth eating. And, and many other sprouts also are very high in this. Um, part of the other reason why I was traveling around with my laboratory was that what we also found was that seed quality is really important. So if we go back to our radish sprouts, um, the nutrition that's in the seed, and a seed should have everything the plant needs, everything the plant needs in it, in order to grow for up to grow after it's germinated for 12 days without anything else. And the reason it also needs a lot of nutrition in the seed is because sometimes seeds, because the soils aren't quite up to scratch, may need to trade off nutrients from the seed to the soil. And of course, we never want the seed to have to, the seedling to have to do that, but the seedling is ready to do that if necessary, by the way. So we can also use this technology to look at the quality of our seeds, because quality seed is where it all starts. If we have quality seed and we have great soils, we can grow nutrient dense food. Uh, some of the new technology, this is elemental imaging for diagnostics. Um, so that purple ring you see there is potassium. This leaf and plants, like we see this in bananas a lot. Um, bananas tend to be, um, can wilt very easily. Uh, we seem to see the edges of the leaves drying and dying off quite a lot. Um, if you look at the blue tips, they are loaded with chloride. Um, you can see the potassium is ringing the chloride uh, to keep the chloride. And so the high concentrations of chloride are being pushed to the tips the tips die off, that chloride goes away. Um, and this is typical of people feeding their plants too much potassium chloride um, and water that's highly chlorinated um, for various reasons. And you can end up with this. And so now what happens? The plants are, yes, potassium deficient because they're using all the potassium to make a barrier to the chloride instead of using the potassium for metabolism. Um, there's a lot to choose from. Question is, is how good are they? And what are the limitations to them? And um, as you know, we have the bionutrient meter. Um, and there are a lot of handheld. This is a big, big, big um, industry right now. There is a lot of technology um, being developed for your, for your phone. Um, a lot of probes. There are issues with it. Accuracy is absolutely one of them. Um, and so uh, this is a case of buyer beware. And maybe it will give you a little indication, but maybe it won't. And maybe you, if it's not accurate enough, you're not actually buying the food that you really need. Um, or maybe you are. It's the same thing. You maybe you might as well just sort of smell it and um, look at it and do the sensory thing as opposed to using some of this technology. And I actually don't know anything about this one, so could be good. Uh, this is our space. This is where I am right now. This is just outside my door. Uh, we are getting ready to have all these instruments installed in that space. Um, and we're going to be doing using the gold standard to test the instruments that we'll be developing um, hand in hand with the Bionutrient Institute. Um, and by then the um, Bionutrient Food Association um, in this lab space. So 
Um, they're coming, we're going to be developing some really interesting new things and they are gonna be accurate because we are gonna be measuring and we are gonna make sure that everything is really well calibrated and we're going to be supporting it. Okay, so what is nutrient density and um, how do we recover nutrient density? Well, we can recover nutrient density um, through soil health. And soil health is the key to all of it. You can see from this diagram, and many of you have seen me present before, already understand um, this diagram. So soil health is a function of the biological, the chemical, and the physical structures of the soil. And, and then it's linked to soil productivity. Soil productivity is generally speaking measured in terms of yield, but it shouldn't be. Um, we should be looking at food quality and environmental quality because if we put all the nutrients into the food, then we don't have some of the, you know, the environmental issues that we're seeing. And ultimately that's gonna benefit our health because we are gonna have nutrient dense food. Um, we measure this in a number of ways. Um, this is tilled and no-till soil. And you can see that when we have well-structured soil, we actually filter the soil and we don't have problems with so sedimentation. We don't have some of the problems that we have with um, nutrient runoff and whatnot. So these are practices that we can focus in on as we work on regenerative. Um, we can use the soil urundies test. Um, you can see it's, and it's a real test. Um, a lot of organisms, especially fungi, break down, um, break down lignans and cotton is lignin. And so if it's eating away the cotton, you can, and the amount that the, the cotton that is eaten is actually an indicator of how biologically active your fungal decomposition community is. And this other one over here is actually mycorrhiza in onions. We can bait out the mycorrhizas and look at them. You can see this really yellow area here. Um, I've re-established um, a test for looking at the percentage of mycorrhizal colonization on roots based on this yellow color, which actually is ubiquitous in most plants. Um, it, the problem is, is that it's very light sensitive. So it's a, you have to be fast um, at you know, guessing the percentage. And it really is a guess, but if you, it's like bricks. If you do it enough, you get pretty accurate. And of course we wanna be measuring microbial activity because that is another aspect. The top one is Solvita. Um, I prefer to use the Solvita test in situ, which means in the soil because, um, well, I wanna know what's happening in the field. I don't really wanna know what happens after I dry my soil, grind my soil and re-wet my soil. I wanna know what's going on in the field. And these tabs are really good at doing that. Um, the other field test, again, these are all handheld tests, things that are easy for you to do, um, would be the soil microbiometer test from Prolific Earth Sciences. And that's another test, very highly accurate, uh, gives you a bacterial to fungal ratio and also tells you microbial biomass. So practices we can use to regenerate soil health. Well, intercropping because diversity is a really, really big part of this. The more diverse root exudates we get, the better the microbial community. And nutrients, the plant, plant uptake is better and plants get more nutrients when it's mediated through a biological system. So if our goal is to build nutrient density, then we need to get our soil biological system working. And that also typically people forget. Everybody focuses on the microbes. Predator-prey relationships are actually the key to all of this. We need the protozoa and we need the nematodes and we need the microarthropods to be driving nutrient recycling so these plants can take it up. Because if it's all tied up in the microbial biomass, a plant can't take it up. Um, yeah, sure, they do a little bit of it, but if we have the whole system working, we have good soil structure, we have great predator-prey relationships, everything can work in harmony and in synchrony so that we have nutrient uptake when we need it. Companion cropping. Um, we have wheat companion crop with desi chickpeas. Desi chickpeas are a wild type. 
wild type chickpeas and yes genetics matter um, we're going to talk a little bit more about genetics um, wild type chickpeas um, form more mycorrhizal associations they take up phosphorus better and um, and they partner really well with wheat and um, and they fix nitrogen as well so the whole thing is is that we can use and i did in this experiment i used the chickpeas to feed the wheat I didn't use any nitrogen with the wheat and I still took a very good yield and made 15% protein. In fact, my yield was above the average at that time on dry land wheat. Um, and, and it was on dark northern spring wheat, which is a high protein wheat. Um, and then we see the other one we see in corn, um, growing companion crops uh, between the rows of corn. Um, we're also, there's also some farmers that are in Iowa that are experimenting with um, growing vegetables between the rows uh, right now and um, seeing if they can relay crop vegetables. Um, very similar to the corn beans and squash um, that the Iroquois Indians were using. Um, multi species cover crops. Now we're going to talk cover crops. Um, cover crops on the off season, cover crops for forage. Um, again, diversity is important. Diversity of root exudates bathing the rhizosphere, creating microbial diversity at the same time. Um, we have better water use efficiency. We have lower disease pressure. There's all these reasons, plant health reasons to do this so that we can have better human health and animal health. And that whole idea of soil structure better soil structure with the multi-species, not as good as soil structure with the monoculture. Um, and so even if we were to use a whole bunch of different mustards and mix them with some other things, we would still get more uh, better soil structure than just by using a monocrop. And that's a really important thing because once again, soil structure drives that predator-prey relationship and drives the nutrient cycling, which we need in order to have more nutrient dense plants. Um, so we do need to be measuring carbohydrates, amino acids, and vitamins. And in our wheat, and of course, that's what I have worked mostly on. So I apologize, you're getting a lot of wheat here. Um, you, we do need to look at amino acid quality because how good is the protein really? Not all proteins are created equal um, and we need specific amino acids from our protein. So we need to be thinking about that. Um, and, and then we also need to be looking at inflammation. Um, you know, some people, celiac people, um, you know, there are 293 different peptides that can influence uh, celiac. So, you know, having anything that has gluten in it is not going to work for them. But there are a lot of variations. And some people are sensitive and certain wheats don't cause those problems. Um, and I think uh, from an inflammation standpoint, we'd be trying to use this inflammation assay and understand more about how foods cause inflammation, what are the attributes of that, um, and if we group them together with different groups of food, can we minimize the inflammation? But I think this tells the story. Um, we've got, and if we focus in on the zinc um, and, and the phosphorus, we can see that we are doing a really good job at getting zinc in some of our grains and that grains can be an excellent source of that. Grains are also an excellent source of magnesium and some of them are better than others. Um, calcium, not so much, and that is typical. I love to see the calcium numbers over 600. Um, that is so much better. Um, and then some of this is a function of the soils. The soils in, um, Saskatchewan tend to be in this area of Saskatchewan where axtons are growing their spelt, tend to be higher in magnesium. And the spout, and in Montana where Bob Quinn in Big Sandy is growing, they tend to have higher manganese and you can kind of see some of the innate soil properties. Uh, oats, uh, again, this was just a brief comparison. So you can see that there is a lot of variation, a ton of variation. And if we look at the silica, which is SI, which is the fourth column over, which again, I can point at right there. 
um, you'll see that the finished oats had a lot of silica. That's because they are smaller, um, a smaller oat, and the husk of an oat is incredibly filled with silicon. Um, so um, yeah, we picked up a, a lot of that. But you can also say that these finished oats were also very high in zinc um, and iron. Uh, again, some of that's the soils, but some of that is also the way they're grown. All of these were grown with cover crops um, and companion crops. Barley, um, just to give you an example of, of some of all of the grains. This is um, genetic diversity in peas from a micronutrient standpoint. This work was done by Michael Grusick. And you can see that there's a huge variety. Um, and that maybe we should be picking different varieties. Um, but how do we pick them? And, you know, again, it comes down to taste. Well, mostly we are picking them for um, the way they're shipped, uh, not that they should taste reasonable, they should ship really well, and they have to be picked in a certain way. So if we're going to, you know, machine pick everything, then they have to have a certain, you know, um, um, durability to them, which, so we're not necessarily picking on nutrient density, which again is instead what we should be doing in my view, and Bob Quinn and I've been having big discussions over this, is that we should be really, we should relook at some of our data and we should look at, well, wait a minute, what ones cross over? What have, which, which plants, which varieties have reasonable yields, high nutrient density, and ship fairly well and harvest reasonably well. And we, we should be having more variables when we're selecting. Uh, this is a wheat trial uh, where we're looking at ancient wheats and we were looking at new wheats and we were looking at the genet the diversity all grown on the same soils all in the same year. And you can see there's a lot of variation and this is the effect of genetics. So once again, we need to focus on, well, what genetics should we be picking? What should we be looking for? Um, and there should be a lot of regional adaptation because the one thing that I know some of the work from Ishmael Chakmak has found in Turkey is that, you know, there's a lot of adaptation to the area and um, some wheats, you know, will have the nutrient density in a specific climate where they won't in others. So, um, and some of that will just be rooting. And this just sort of brings it all together. I want people to see that, you know, red fife is an old variety and it does vary uh, between where it's grown in Ohio or Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, we've got Mo Montana and Ohio for red tur for turkey red. Um, Rouge de Bordeaux is another old variety that's being grown in Montana and then some of the new varieties. And again, you can see the difference. Um, I think if you look at the last two, the difference between cover crops and then no-till, getting that soil structure right with reducing the amount of tillage is really important to your nutrient cycling. And then in the end, you can grow the same variety and grow it in all these different places in the same way and have a, you know, a serious amount of variation. Once again, that whole adaptation. I thought people might be interested in this. Um, we've recently started this little study and looking at corn varieties. Um, there are some ancient corns. A lot of the, the colored corns are quite ancient. Um, what is really interesting about them is that um, a lot of times, it doesn't matter where they grow, they are actually very similar. And that is very true for the blue corn. Um, and uh, I thought that was really fascinating. There's not very much variation. Uh, companion cropping in corn, in this case, that is genetically modified corn. Uh, this is Chris Chichout in Southern Iowa. Uh, this is an experiment he did where he was companion cropping and I am giving you um, some of the values. Uh, the one value is highlighted because uh, clearly that I can't believe that's real, but um, I didn't get a chance to reanalyze this um, uh, at that time. At the time, so I'm presenting the data as we presented it, and you can see um, what you can see is also the cobs that were associated. These are 
what we would call representative cobs of that um, of the corn that was associated with that companion. All of these were yielding somewhere in the range of uh, 270 bushels to 300 bushels. Recovering. Well, if we can recover our soil health, that means that we recover water quality, air quality, human health, animal health. Um, we can regenerate landscapes and that is a happy factor. Um, there's actually been research on that that shows that people love driving around, riding their bikes around, walking around agricultural landscapes. It gives them a great feeling. And think of what it would look like if it was full of flowers and humming bees and all of these things. It's, it's a happier factor, which means that your consumer base is probably a lot happier. And then in the end, as farmers, we have the opportunity to rehumanize agriculture. Um, still the majority of farms in the United States are family operations. Um, that means they are very human and um, we're really, agriculture has been severely demonized and it's time to take that back as farmers. Uh, rebuilding the food system, nutrient density and food quality matter. Absolutely, they matter. Um, and food ingredients, um, yeah, food ingredients are marketed on quality and nutrient density and fortified foods is not the cheap option. Um, and why are we fortifying foods anyways? I mean, the food should already be forti food, uh, should already be fortified. I think what happened there, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm just surmising here, but as we really made yield a priority, I mean, the nutrient density just tanked, um, specifically in a lot of our grain crops. And when that happened, it was like, well, we, we need to fortify it because somehow it was deemed that agriculture was incapable of doing this. Um, and that's not true. It's just that farmers didn't get paid for it. Uh, if farmers had got paid more money for a quality product, I'm sure they would have been incentivized to keep improving and keep maintaining a higher nutrient density. Um, but for some reason, it was cheaper to fortify the food than it was to pay the farmers. And I think it's time to, again, take that back. Uh, and if we do rebuild the food system, subsidies should be obsolete. I mean, whoa, that is a scary thought, but I think that should be true because farmers be incentivized. And if you're not growing a quality product and you're just growing feed quality and you're growing stuff that's not good for anybody, just a whole bunch of useless calories, well, then you need to think about your system and maybe start doing something different. Uh, so where do we go from here? Up, up, up. Uh, this is my graduate student, Naomi, um, who will be coming here to work with us. Uh, she works on um, inflammation and food and inflammation. Uh, analyzing food can be fun and it's a teachable moment. And we need to be working with kids. Uh, yes, kids can run the tracer. Kids will be able to run all these handheld instruments and we need to build from the ground up. So not only building soils from the ground up, we're building our community from the ground up and we're empowering kids and helping them to grow up to really appreciate food and farmers in a better way. Possibilities are endless as long as you have an open mind and a gracious heart and just open your mind. Don't get stuck with, well, that can't be possible. Truthfully, right now, probably anything is possible. There is gonna be such a thing as food that saves your life. And we are already, I mean, there are food pharmacies, there are people like, um, actually like, um, I'll give a plug for Dr. Drew Ramsey's new book on how to um, eat your way out of depression and anxiety. Um, and talks about the key nutrients that are for you, that are good for your brain. And hopefully the backs of those packages are gonna say something about that. And we're gonna have some app that helps you choose. So I want you all to eat well, be well, stay well. Um, 
this is um, one of your sponsors is No Regrets. This is in at Piscine's Ranch, um, standing beside some of the grapevines that I helped plant in the original vineyard, um, enjoying a wine. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, as you can see from this, um, Rise of Terror has always believed that healthy soil is related to our health and, and our food supply. And we, I am truly grateful for the opportunity to be here today. And I hope you've all enjoyed what I had to say. And if you haven't, well, you know, have at it and we'll have a good discussion. Wait till next week's present presenter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Jill. Like we're getting some, getting some nice uh, thank yous and heads and uh, on the, on the chat. Um, so we've got a, a couple of questions coming in here. Are you ready to jump to the Q and A? Yeah, and I'll just stop sharing. Okay, great. Oh yeah, now I can see the chat. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so Sherry says, "Teach the kids to taste." I'm guessing that's part of the getting the meters out there, but teaching them also about their mouth and their in their uh, yeah sensory. Instincts. You know, I didn't have any pictures of all the kids with their, you know. Uh, the soils up in their face and smelling soils and comparing the, the you know, the smell of the soil. But um, yeah, I, for some reason, I couldn't find any of those. I think I was just too caught up in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Okay. Isabel asks if you could repeat the link to the two infield soil tests that you mentioned. Ah, yes. Um, actually, how about I just type them in the chat? Um, that would be... Soil microbiometer and um, Solvita. Yeah, Solvita was the other one, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Jim Porterfield asks How does an individual get a personal point of reference for a reasonable price? Would sending food to AL in Indiana for a feed test be a good place to start? Yeah, and actually, you can send it to a number of other labs for a feed test. So, weirdly enough, like I said, animals, the, the whole industry has been really um, focused on animal health. So even our vitamins, like when we um, uh, first discovered vitamins, it was at the University of Wisconsin in animal, in animal science and agriculture. So you can see again that link between animal health, agriculture, and food. And they started looking at vitamins because they were interested in how the animals were responding and why they were having some other issues. Um, so yeah, I thought that the whole vitamin thing was kind of interesting and why we were doing that. I think, well, that's a very interesting story. I remember Jerry Bernetti explaining it to me about how the animal scientists had been the ones who figured out that you know, if the animals don't have a, a complete suite of these elements and vitamins in their systems, they're not going to grow well. Right. And so if you ever read a bag of, you know, of um, chicken grain, it'll have 15 different elements in it. But I know. I mean, we do know more about it because we were concerned. So yeah. what happened, right? They were concerned that animals weren't reproducing really well. And it's like, there's something yeah. missing from their diet. We, yeah. we didn't ask that question. But, you know, animal scientists did. It's like, well, that's not yielding very well. We should figure out that out. And, right. and so really it's been animal science that has really dove into mineral nutrient density way more than everybody else. And, and those principles are not necessarily applied in our food supply for humans. That is um, correct. To complete the point. But, but the question was about, was Jim's question about um, an inexpensive baseline and so you're oh yeah an innocent an inexpensive baseline sorry lost my train of thought on that one um inexpensive baseline i think you could send it to any laboratory for a feed analysis and they will give you baseline nutrient data um of course we know that the bfa will do some of that as well um but yeah feed analysis is great really that'll just give you some rough numbers some rough elements and yeah and dry matter and protein and things like that. So yeah. the problem with a lot of these things is if you don't have context, if you don't have a hundred other samples to look against, then, you know, four PPM doesn't necessarily mean anything. No, and we need to have a balance. So like when I showed you that data, I mean, I've been looking at corn samples for about five years. And so I know that corn tends to be quite low in zinc and quite low in micronutrients, which wheat tends to be a whole lot higher. Um, and so, you know, but I, I kind of have an idea of where things should be. And it's true, but you've got to start somewhere. 
And even if you can gather up all your neighbors and some other people and everybody can go together and just analyze some of the grains, even, even if you stored some, like a lot of people have stored grain from like two or three years. Well, if you've got samples, send them in, have analysis and see what you've done over time. Jim's response here is compared to the USDA database. And I would suggest that our experience has been in sampling a lot of crops that when you look at the variation that exists, the USDA average is somewhere at around the 15th to 20th percentile of the variation of the broader variation. So, and we also have to understand that they haven't sampled that much. And there's very, very few samples in their data. And there's very few samples in there and they tend to be fairly regional, um, like specific to a region. Whereas, you know, what we're trying to do and what others are doing is looking at things from across um, the world and, you know, and actually looking at, well, what are the, the levels and what should we be looking at? Yeah. And I, I would argue that we really don't know that. So it's probably better to start on your own and see where you're at and see if you can build it up. And yeah, start, start where you are and, and, and monitor over time. We're, yeah. we're, trying to, we're trying to build that whole complete database out for everybody to have access right. to. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's what open source is all about, is about having that database, being able to see what everybody else is doing and what their levels are as well. Yeah. And, and, and trying to understand, and which is what we're trying to do too, is trying to understand, you know, what are the practices that are driving this? And I've always believed that soil health is what drives nutrient density to the point where actually I've been recently chatting with Ross Welsh and, and we were talking about the time when he was touting genetics and how we needed to genetically modify everything to enhance nutrient density. And I challenged him and I wrote a white paper to the World Bank on how the rhizosphere was actually more important than genetic modification. If only they'd listened. You know, <laughs> you just gotta keep plugging away. Yeah, you know, I know nobody can say I haven't been tenacious. <laughs> Maybe look at citizen people. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, Chris asks, how far off do you believe we are from an accurate handheld nutrient density assessment? Um, well, I think that we're actually a lot closer than we all think. Um, I'm gonna guess that we are really looking at this within the next year, for sure, at having something. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I don't believe that there's gonna be one tool that's gonna to do all this. I think there'll be a suite of instruments that are gonna do this because the one thing we do know from having looked at and, and for me having worked in handheld instruments is that you know some of these um, uh, light-based instruments are very good at molecules, whereas the X-ray instrument is very good at minerals and, and, and new, you know, mineral nutrients. And somehow we've got to marry that. And if we want accuracy, then we may have to use two or three instruments, but hopefully they'll all be handheld and they'll be very, you know, be reasonably priced so that you can actually use them. I think that was the piece Chris did not put in this question. He asked for accurate and handheld. He didn't say less than $5,000. So, <laughs> um, but yes, no, actually it is quite exciting how rapidly it's moving along and we're erring on the side of saying less and doing more, but um, yeah. it's moving quite along. So yeah, uh, great. Okay, uh, Bridget asks, um, would you please explain how convenience made it on the quality infographic? <laughs> uh, yeah, convenience because, um, you know what's really interesting about that is that um, I was reading a number of papers on Africa and um, people tend to buy food that is convenient for them at the time and not necessarily make good choices. So you might have to go to the supermarket to get a, an apple, um, which you actually find now that a lot of truck stops and things like that have vet fruits and vegetables for sale. But in Africa, a lot of times like the rural people, they have to grow everything themselves. So they actually covet um, convenience foods. Um, and things that they can't normally have. Um, and people in the city tend to not eat enough fruits and vegetables because they're just grabbing convenient food. Um, and they're making choices based on convenience. We apparently, um, we all do. 
So when we go into the supermarket, there is a reason why some foods, a lot of, of vendors pay money, uh, food companies pay money to have it at eye level. So you are flooded visually with an abundance of a particular product and you were like, oh, that's convenient, it's right there. It's right at the front of the store. Why do you think all the candies are at the cash register? They're there because it's convenient. And you're like, oh, kind of feel like a sweet. Oh, kind of feel like a chocolate. Oh, you know, and it's not just because of your kids. It's because of you too. That's why the magazines are there and other choices. So I think that's why they put convenience on there. I don't think that should be part of quality, except that I think that part of the reason it was there is because we want to make good choices more convenient. Yeah. And, and that's something that, that is not happening just yet. And even with the, you know, apples and bananas there at the truck stop, they're not necessarily of great caliber. No, um, and they're just there as the token person who might want to eat something, yeah. you know? Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's on there because they want food to be convenient. Um, but the one thing that keeps coming out of the EU, which is really distressing for me, is that they always want food to be cheaper. Mm -hmm. And I meant to say this earlier, and I was hoping we, I'd find a way to sort of push this in. Well, the price coming right up here, I can. Okay. Um, the, like. I don't believe that food should be cheaper under any circumstances. Um, I think that, you know, I was looking at the stats the other day and people now spend 32 to 33% of their income on healthcare. Uh, and they used to only spend 5%. So what if we went back to 5%, let's just say 30 and you had 25% more income to use. How about using 5% more of it on food? You'd still have 20% less, 20% left that you could spend on other things if you want to, or why not spend 10% more on food and really boost your health and then never have to spend anything on healthcare. I mean, let's think about it that way. I mean, price food should not be cheaper because we are never going to help people, farmers grow more nutrient dense food if we don't paying them. I mean, right now, if you really want to get money for nutrient density, you have to be growing the food, processing the food, packing the food, and selling the food yourself in order to get paid for it. Not for long. Not for long. Not for long. We're gonna and have... not if I have anything to do with it. No, I'm to... <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna adjust those those uh this, yeah infrastructure dynamics and yeah the... absolutely market yeah. premium. Yeah. So I'll just go to that question Greg asked. Um, do you think prices will be expensive for nutrient dense foods? And how can we keep that from happening while also compensating the farmer? How can we ensure that people of all income levels can have access to nutrient dense food? Thanks so much for a great presentation. Um, I think that everyone will have access to nutrient dense food because I think more and more it will become the norm. I mean, we have seen organic food decrease in price as well um, as we've had more and more of it. And I think you'll find that if we, if, and this is my true hope, is that nutrient dense food will become mostly the norm and, and that all of us will have an opportunity to buy nutrient dense food and we'll all have the choice. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, from my understanding of what it looks like with the markets and things like that, maybe it'll be a 10 or 15% margin per, per bushel of grain or, or something like that. Um, but if you look at the nutrient levels and you see that there's three times as many nutrients in that bushel of grain as the least less expensive one, it's actually costing less per unit of nutritional value. Yeah, so and that's where that health index came in, you know, like calories and nutrient right. dense. And you, it, I, it reminds me, and I wrote this in my notes, there's a Levi commercial right now on the TV that mm -hmm. says, you know, it, it's all these young people and it's like, well, if you buy better, you can wear it more and then you need less clothing and then it will be better for the environment. Well, in food, it's pretty much the same way. If you buy higher quality food, you need to eat less of it. You will probably be well yeah. by eating it and then you won't need to spend so much money on the doctor. Huh. <laughs> and you'll have more energy and more- And more energy and, and you'll just be having so, so much 
better yeah. of a time. Yeah. Or so we presume. Uh, so, so we so presume. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Emmanuel has a statement he'd like to make, which is okay. that um, kids need to be taught that they are part of nature and are dependent on nature. From there, it is only a matter of tapping in, tapping their innate interest in living creatures. And, I uh, couldn't agree more. Um, okay. I, I think that, um, you know, nature deficit disorder is real. And, um, you know, when Dan, when you and I were in France and we were walking around on the, in the concrete jungle of Paris, um, you know, the first thing that really struck me was like, these children are growing up, going to the park and that's their only nature. Well, thank goodness they had the park. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we, we you're right we're not appreciating that and we need to get our kids out like and that was what so was so important for me to show that slide of um of of us looking at worms out at circle seven farms in kansas um just you know it's like hey can we go to the garden and look at worms it's like sure let's go <laughs> yeah. well i think you know it's uh, i'm one of my deeper critiques about the culture broadly is that we're you know incentivized to be primarily operating out of these, you know, <laughs> boxes, as opposed to primarily engaging in a natural environment. And it really does have all these knock on detrimental effects. Oh, um, absolutely. It does. Uh, you know, I mean, un, you know, almost impossible to address without systemically changing your lifestyle. Um, yep. which some people feel threatened by that conversation, but, um, no, I think, well, I mean, that's the biggest thing. I mean, when I was writing that paper on vitamin D, um, we have children all over the world right now and and not the undeveloped world so-called but the developed world that are having rickets again yeah. why in this time would we be having rickets rickets is vitamin d deficiency and it's because all these kids are sitting inside <laughs> on screens on screens they are not being exposed to sunlight in any way yeah. And now you're seeing mothers blogging about, get your kids outside, go to the playground, you know? Um, and at the same time, you have the pediatricians of the world saying, oh, don't go outside, you'll get skin cancer. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, really, we need to find a balance here. Pretty sure we evolved in nature, uh, <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe we evolved somewhere else. Oh, I'm sure we evolved in nature <laughs> and not these concrete skyscrapers. <laughs> Oh, uh, Jim Porterville has another question. Have you seen any change in nutrient density of apples after Mount St. Helens spread its ash? Oh, I wish I could answer that one, but that is such a good question. I, I haven't looked at apples well enough to know that. I mean, I've done my own apples, but that was long after Mount St. Helens. So you yeah. In the seventies? No. <laughs> Apples. <laughs> um, I, I have heard that things have, you know, grown more well after Mount St. Helens. Well, it certainly well, remineralized things. I mean, yeah, that was a lot of mineral ash. Yeah. And a lot of it. And, and it would have been really high in micronutrients for sure. Yeah. And we know that trace elements are really important in all of this discussion. Verging on foundational. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, uh, Greg asks, uh, does the mineral content in the soil profile affect nutrient density? Is there an optimal level for each mineral in addition to multi-species cover crop? That's a good one. Oh boy, that's multi, that has different- Layers, yeah. Layers, that's layered. Um, okay, give me the first one again. I wanna go, I'll go uh, in does order. Does the mineral content in the soil profile affect nutrient density? Yes, the mineral content of the soil does and the profile does. Um, and that, so in that one slide I showed where, you know, there was more manganese in some of the soils, more magnesium in other soils, that is the parent soil, the parent material driving, um, the mineral nutrient density. So for example, we tend to have really high iron in the Pacific Northwest because most farmers are farming on basalt rock. So it's really high in iron, really high in manganese. And in some areas, it almost borders on toxic manganese. Um, and the Great Plains and North Dakota and part of South Dakota, they tend to have toxic selenium soils. So um, 
they actually, there's, they, you'll see a lot of selenium in the grains that they grow. And for a while there, they were exporting at a high premium to Europe for the high selenium content grain. Uh, so yes, now the next part was the cover crops. And yes. Is, is there an optimal level for each mineral? Uh, there, an optimal level, there's, um, every plant requires it's an optimal level. So if you were thinking about, well, you know, do I need to find a soil that has optimal levels? Um, the one thing I would say is that um, plants can get out what they want. So one of the things that we haven't done is we haven't been reading total mineral nutrient density in soils. Um, so we need to be looking at the total amount of minerals in the soil and then understanding that plants can gain access to them when they need them. Um, there are okay. optimum levels yeah. for sure, but most of those models are based on removal models. And so I would argue that we still need to, we may need to rethink some of it because we're, we're basing a lot of our optimum levels on removal. And we're basing optimal levels also on removal in a tillage system as well, which also changes the way we grow food. So um, I think that I would say that there are, I'm sure there are optimal levels, um, but one of the things that people um, aren't thinking about is there is a, some really great books on plant analysis. There are some really old books that actually list, comb the data and list where plants should be from a nutrient standpoint at di from different places in the world at different stages of their life. And it's like an encyclopedia. Um, I have to find it in my library, but that book is amazing because um, it actually tells you what the level should be based on this compendium of all these plants that they analyzed a long time ago. It was done in Australia and it's an excellent book. It's out of print, um, but it deserves to be in print again because it's actually an excellent book for figuring out what those optimum levels would be. And I would use the plant as your indicator. And that's why I like that plant analysis book. And then the last part of it was about cover crops. And um, yeah, I mean, I can use, um, and I just realized that slide wasn't in my presentation. Um, you can use um, different cover crops to pull up different nutrients. So for example, buckwheat, um, for example, if you put buckwheat in, buckwheat pulls magnesium and phosphorus and boron and a lot of the, and calcium into preferentially likes to take that up. And then it creates an organic that puts it into its tissues, which makes it organic, which actually means that now it's more available to be broken down and available to the plants through the microbial community. Um, we know that when we add um, phacelia or lentils, lentils are very good at getting iron. Well, of course they're fixing nitrogen, so they need iron, um, but they're also very good at getting iron out of the soil. So if you're struggling with iron, um, planting lentils around your trees and whatnot will actually help with um, your iron nutrition. So yeah, we're starting to understand that. And interestingly enough, there actually has been some of the herbologists and in um, some of the um, uh, journals that look at um, medicinal plants actually have discovered this a long time ago. And so now it's about really putting some of this information into one place so that everybody can use it. Once again, that open concept thing. That open, that open thing. That open thing. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had John Kempf on earlier talking about doing a you know and a, a deep soil core to see what is not present in your soil, um, and you know then again at that after that once you've addressed what's not present, not needing to do soil tests again. And we had Walter Yena on I think it was last week talking about the the mycelial you know. Yeah web and how they are discriminatorily you know pulling in what the plant needs from the ecosystem so it's not like this concept of you know all these things are there in little bottles and they all can't be controlled they're all present that's just not how life works it no it, and it's not how the soil works the soil how, is going from source to sink and yeah. the mycorrhizae are moving things from sources to sinks like things that don't have it that's why multi-species plant communities tend to have 
very good nutrition and tend to not suffer from drought is because the plants that have access to these things are actually sharing with everybody else. So um, there's a lot of sharing going on when you get it right. And um, we have leached a lot of nutrients. And so that's why adding deep rooted plants to your cover crop are really important in building your soil your soil profile, like your soil structure, deeper and deeper and deeper so that you can start to mine the, all the nutrients that you've lost over time. Yeah. And we don't even know what happens when you get to the Vados, but you know, people are thinking about it. So we've only got 10 minutes left. Um, and we can maybe just go a little bit quicker on some of these questions yep. for them all. Um, uh, Bill and Jay asked if you could please repeat the plant analysis book. I'm not sure if you actually gave the title of it. I didn't. So let me... Um, let me just go and get it so I can actually do this. Just the name is what they're looking for, I think. Actually, I'll have to post it. I, I'm, you know, I've moved and I don't know where everything is, but I do have it. And when I find it, I will put it up um, we can for, put it to give it to Liz and she can post it. Great. Um, uh, Patrick asks, can you share that white paper about the importance of the rhizosphere versus genetics? Um, yes, I can. And I will, um, I'll, it's, it's quite old and I'll go and find it and share it. Same, same thing. Um, <clears throat> Lenore asks, are your colleagues working to inform slash influence the upcoming UN Food Summit? which is dominated by the corporate powers, think Bill Gates, who are pushing for more globalized automated big ag, it is empowering small farmers and greenwashing, not based on soil health or true nutrient density. I'm not sure she has an opinion on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I'm, your breath. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe you are. Um, I, I wasn't planning on it, but I think that um, uh, the, with Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, they certainly have really bought into genetic modification as the way forward. And they certainly haven't bought into revitalizing soils. And I think that we need to push back on that for sure. Yeah, um, I did actually read something this morning that said that because of the um, civil society, you know, broader community had felt so, um, boxed out of of the of the process that they are setting up an alternate um oh, so they're like okay. this is all corporate controlled and so we're not going to waste our breath you're telling the story that it's a that everybody has a has a voice but it's just basically you can be in a zoom room so you don't really have a lot of a lot of say um i, I think it's time that we a lot more people let their voices to this um because we've seen the power of social media and and how if people really want to go after something they can. Yeah. It's time. Um, Greg asks, uh, what are the connections you are seeing with soil health related, relating to human health? Um, well, uh, one of the things is that we are, uh, we can't really do, we're, we're working on working with some folks that are doctors on this question because it's really important. But one of the things that we're seeing is that when we push nutrients into the soil, um, from the soil into the plants, people are, I mean, we know that food can be medicine. But the one thing is that we have seen with soil health, and we saw this a long time ago, was that when we switched to no-till and we started to put cover crops in, <clears throat> that we got a lot less dust in the air and people suffered less from asthma and rhinitis and allergies. Um, so there's a perfect example how changing a soil practice actually directly influenced um, people's health. But you know, broadly to be able to make those statements is requires a ton of work. Well, on... actually, there was a study, and Jeff Mitchell published that study in the '80s, showing that in the Central Valley of California, that no-till made a difference to the um, respiratory health of its occupants in, in that valley. But that was not pertaining directly to the food that was being eaten. It was to no, uh, that wasn't food. That's just a health link, soil think, health and link. Um, and we we have to work on that. But if we look at some of the new books that are coming out, 
like I said, like Drew Ramsey's book, they talk about the nutrients you need for your brain to function. Well, yeah, and then Ross Welsh's earlier study, um, really early study on Bangladesh um, showed very clearly that as they started working towards um, growing better crops and paying more attention to the soils, they got more zinc in, the, in their crops and that their children actually started to function better in school. That was, uh, that was a little indirect, but. You know. Zinc deficiency is one of those things that's it's a, a global issue, right? And Yes, it is a global issue. You get a 2x or 3x improvement in zinc concentrations in your plants, then you can prevent some of these major stunting and developmental issues. So Yeah, I mean, that's and you a, have better immune system and you have better skeletal health and all these things. Zinc is just one of those really key elements. Yeah. All right. Uh, Greg asks, um, could many small scale farms focused on nutrient dense foods in a given area be a good answer to growing nutrient dense food where people are living? Sounds like it. Sounds like it. I think that I don't think that um, we should discount big farms. I think that the big farms too can do the same thing. I don't think we necessarily need to have a whole bunch of small farms um, unless you want to be a farmer. Um, if you want to be a farmer, then, you know, we have to find ways for people who want to farm to farm. Um, but by the same token, I really don't think that all big farms are doing a bad job. And I showed it there. All those farms and the data I showed were all from big farms. Yeah. And they're doing a good job. In fact, many farmers are operating on a larger scale are doing a better job than from a traditional standpoint or an ecological standpoint than farmers on a smaller scale. So, yeah. It doesn't, I mean, I, I do, I do appreciate that you are so strong on that point. Um, that just because <laughs> you're managing a large piece of land does not mean you're doing it poorly. There may be an argument about culture and humans relationship and polyculture. Yeah, there might be an argument that way, but I mean, on, on the other hand, some of the people that are farming large tracts of land, um, there are five and six generations mm -hmm. on the same property. Yeah. Okay, we've got one last question here. Jim uh, asks if you can say a word about soil respiration. Yeah, um. <laughs> uh, soil respiration is, um, I think you would want to be measuring it in situ, so in the field. I really want you to be measuring it in the field because that's where it really matters. And that's where it gives you an idea of how active your, bio your soil biology are. It doesn't necessarily give you a measure of the protozoa or the deco, and it will give you an idea of decomposition. Uh, it will give you an idea. You can measure respiration. If you did it in the field and you did all at the same time, you could compare crops, you could compare the things that you're doing and you would find differences. And that is exciting. And, you know, even, I mean, but then to take it to another level, just because you have respiration assessed, doesn't mean you necessarily have a good understanding about who the communities are. Oh, no, you have no understanding of who the community is. You just know it's, 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 it's happy there's, and it's going after it. Active down there to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're it's, a long way from understanding diversity. Um, yeah. Diversity uh, below ground is just, we know that it's so much magnitudes greater than above ground. So, um, and, and I'm not sure that we really need to care. I, I think- The question is how much do we need to know and how much do we need to just know what to do? Um, I think we just need to know what to do. And I think if yeah. it's not broken, you know, don't try and fix it. Uh, but at the same time, I think we, you know, this is coming back to that, that comment earlier about kids being more in tune with the land. I think it's okay to just know. Yeah. I, I think- a, Better to just know. Yeah, because I think a lot of farmers, when they go in the field and I asked them, I said, how many of you don't know when your field is not functioning perfectly, even if it looked perfectly green, how many of you know that there might be a problem? Everybody put up their hand. How many of you, when you look at it, you and you walk through the field, you get this intense feeling that things are pretty good and yet you're doing okay. And they all they all knew. And it's like, well, okay, so why isn't that good enough? We're having a couple presentations on that exact topic coming up in this conference. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to it. Directing people's, you know, attention to that 
those faculties, not just the empirical, linear, you know, numerical. Yeah, uh, I think it's okay to just know. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, well, in the last minute here, are there any final words of wisdom you'd like to share with us or commentaries or? Uh, or no, uh, I'm just grateful for all the questions and um, and I'm I'm grateful for the people that took their time today to listen to what I have to say and um, I hope it was valuable. Wonderful. As usual, I think so. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Jill. Great. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.